Welcome, friends. Uh, thanks for tuning back again as we continue our study through the book of Revelation. Uh, thrilled that you're here, and we, as, as we do every uh, lesson, we've got a lot to cover. So we're just going to pray, and we're going to dive right into it. So let's pray together. Father, uh, once again, I thank you for the beauty of your word and the power that it has when we understand it, the difference that it makes in this world that we live. And Lord, I'd like to humbly ask right now that you would anoint uh, the words that I speak, that the influence of your spirit right now at this moment would do uh, what I could not do on my own. And that is the understanding of your word and the communication of your word. And it's not only to relay uh, the truth, but it is also to receive it that we need your anointing. And so I pray for every person who views this study that there is an influence of the Spirit into their life as well, and that there is an understanding that they receive uh, through this study that will significantly make a difference in how they view the world and how they live their life. And so we are thrilled that we get to do this. We're honored again that we have the that we have the 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 word of God at our fingertips, but we pray that you will make it understood, that you will communicate it well. So pour that blessing upon us, Lord, and uh, we will give you the praise for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, we need to take just a couple of minutes or so and remind ourselves uh, the previous lesson that we talked about in chapter 5. And um, unfortunately, these lessons, we kind of break them up. And so we ended up at chapter 5, and chapter 6 is going to just attach right on to it. So I just think it's a good idea uh, to go back and remind ourselves, because it's probably been a week or so since uh, you've watched this. So the scene, uh, going back uh, to chapters 4 and 5, Remember, we are in heaven, okay? We're in heaven, and we talked enough about that last time, how important it is to know where we are at. And so we're in heaven, and Jesus is about to open up a scroll that has seven seals on it. And so that was all the ending of chapter 5 there. And we suggested then that the scroll is to be understood as how God is going to respond uh, to this battle of good and evil. And so what's happening in the control room of heaven, under the control of God, in how he is going to deal with all this good and battle uh, fighting each other. One of my good friends described the scroll in a way a number of years ago uh, when he did a study on Revelation. And I thought, that is such a great description of the scroll that I wrote it down and I knew I would use it at some point. And so I went back and found it. And he wrote this, the scroll is the absolute detailed plan of how God will condemn wickedness and reward righteousness. I want to read that again. The scroll is the absolute detailed plan of how God will condemn wickedness and reward righteousness. So that's what's happening. We're going to open up this scroll. We're in the control room of heaven, and we're going to see what God is going to do about this. He is going to reward righteousness and condemn wickedness. Now, I love the reward righteousness part of that. I love that. This book describes in great detail the, the beauty of what heaven is going to be like and how you and I are going to be there if we trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And uh, we just say, man, I can't wait for that to happen, to experience that. There's a sense of, of hope and encouragement in this book when you think about people that you and I already know and love who are there right now. And so the idea of how God is going to reward righteousness, man, that is great. But but. <laughs> Let me be honest with you, and maybe it shows a little bit of my not too good side. I just I want to put the cards on the table. I love the idea of wickedness being condemned. 
I kind of like that too. I, I want to hear about how God is going to condemn wickedness. And, and you know why I, I kind of like that part? You know why? Because I'm tired of evil and wickedness messing up my life and messing up your life and all the discouragement it brings uh, to our world. I'm tired of that. And I've heard enough of you respond back in this study that that's kind of hit a nerve with some of you too. We're just worn out with evil having its time in our life. And we're going to open up this scroll and find out that God will condemn wickedness. I'm just worn out with it. I've always thought that before a person is baptized, we ought to make them memorize 1 Peter 5.8. So you don't memorize 1 Peter 5, 8, we're not going to baptize you. It says this, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. You know who somebody is? You, me. The, the word devour, I read this, I thought it was really cool. The word devour used there in the Greek language, it, it actually refers to uh, somebody taking a glass, of, a glass of something and just a great big gulp. They just, they just gulp it completely down. And, and the idea here is to devour a drink. And, and Peter writes and says, that's what Satan wants to do to people. Wants to devour us. And, and you've got to understand that in order to appreciate uh, what this book is written about. We're in this battle of good and evil, and evil wants to devour us. It just wants to, to do away with us. And the longer you live in this world, the more scratches of that you're going to get on you. And you get enough scratches on you, and you start to see how you can't wait for wickedness to be condemned. And, and you think about your life and my life, and you probably get stories where you're just, you're just worn out about that. I, I'm, I'm going to get transparent with you for a minute. I, I wanted to do this in the study so that we get on the same page with us. I want you to, I want you to feel it like me, okay? I became a pastor a million years ago, and I remember that when I was a young, innocent pastor, here's what I thought that was. I, I thought that was visiting old ladies, sweet old ladies in a hospital somewhere or a nursing home and and visiting everybody in the congregation who loved everybody and them having us over for fried chicken dinner and preaching sermons that everybody loved. That's what I thought it was. And, and now that I'm a seasoned uh, older pastor, I have found out that it isn't hardly any of that. It is a front row seat to every evil arrow that Satan can possibly shoot. That's what a job of a pastor is, to watch what evil does to our people, our sheep, our families. I've told people many times, there's nothing I haven't seen. And I, I imagine that there probably are, is, but, but you know what I'm talking about. I, I've seen more arrows of the enemy than I would ever, ever want to say. I'm just worn out with it. I'm worn out with it. And the day that I'm doing this study, there has been more effects of evil in in our community and in the lives of people that I love. And maybe you've had kind of a day like that too. And I am just, I'm, I'm worn out with it. I'm, I'm worn out with it. And, and so we look at chapter six and when that all gets down into the core of who you are and you start feeling it, you start to understand the importance of this scroll being opened up because God is not only going to reward righteousness, he is going to condemn wickedness. He's going to defeat it. And, and when you when you catch the spirit of that and when you, you feel it, okay, when it gets down into you, you understand back in chapter 5 why John wept because they couldn't find anybody worthy enough to open the scroll. 
And the scroll is going to condemn wickedness. The scroll is going to reward righteousness and nobody can open it. And you, you, you can sense that and think, what do you mean nobody can open it? But, but we know how chapter 5 ends, okay? Uh, Jesus shows up. And Jesus is worthy to open the scroll. And so you get to chapter 6 and say, open it, open it, open it, so that we can see this happen. Righteousness rewarded, wickedness condemned. Now, with all that said, um, what we're going to do in this particular lesson is we're going to start opening the scroll by looking at the first four seals on the scroll. So you all know that by now. There are seven seals on the scroll. As each one comes off, we see a little bit more how the control room of heaven, how God is going to take care of this battle of good and evil. To, today we're going to look at the first four of those seals. It's in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 6, and I'm just going to read the whole text, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about them. So chapter 6, verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. And to him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked. And there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! And I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Trider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him, and they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. Now, if you've ever read about the four horsemen of Revelation 6, probably the first time you ever read about those, you thought, what on earth is this about? Well, by the time we're done, you're going to have a really good idea of what John begins to tell us in the sixth chapter there. I'm going to look at a couple different things in these verses. I'm, I'm going to kind of deal with two categories today. One of those, I want to talk some details about all of the seals. These are very, very important that we talk about those. And once we understand the details of those seals, then I want to jump in and I want to identify the very first four of those seals. So let's talk about some details first. Um, th this is really important that you understand uh, what I'm going to say here. This is, I don't even know how to say. Make sure that you catch this. You, you already know uh, kind of the general theme of the book of the battle of good and evil is going to be played out in history, and God is going to win that battle eventually. We already know that. We mention it over and over as the theme. And the basic storyline of good destroying evil, here's what I want you to hear, is told in three storylines. So good will defeat evil, and he's going to tell us that with three stories in the book. Three different stories. And one of those stories is the opening of seven seals, and then he will tell the same story again in the blowing of seven trumpets, and then finally he will tell that story a third time with the pouring out of seven bowls. So it, I, I want that to become very familiar with you. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. 
Those are three storylines that tell the same story. Good will defeat evil. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, I, I want you to write this down because some of you will want that. The seven seals start in chapter 6, verse 1, and go through chapter 8, verse 2. That's a total of 35 verses. We'll tell that first storyline. The trumpets are told in chapter 8, verse 6, through chapter 11, verse 19, and that's a total of 57 verses. And then the seven bowls, chapter 16, verse 1, through chapter 16, verse 21, that's a total of 21 verses. So get that into your head, okay? Good defeats evil. That's the theme of the book, okay? That's what the whole book is about. Three ways we're going to hear it. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Now, we're going to talk about this other item a little bit more later in the book. And at this point, I just want to tantalize it with you, but I want to make sure that you catch it here. Each time the story is told, seals, trumpets, bowls, the story intensifies a little bit more. Now, now you might remember early on when I talked about progressive parallelism. So the book was structured into seven sections and, and each section takes us a little bit closer to the end. Remember that first section kind of goes here. Then the second section, we go back, we tell it again. We go a little bit closer to the end. Each time, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And you find the same thing happening with the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Don't get lost with me here. Every time the story intensifies... Now, again, we're going to talk about it in detail as we get into those things, but let me just kind of tantalize with you for a second, and you'll, you'll see what I mean here. Let me read one of the verses of the seals. We just read it a minute ago. Revelation 6, 8. L listen really carefully to this. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So I want you to catch this. With the seals, it affected one-fourth of the earth. Don't miss that. Now, we move over to the trumpets, okay? Seals, trumpets, bowls. Now let's look at the trumpets. Let me read one of the trumpets. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. I would almost bet money you've never noticed that. We've went from one-fourth to one-third. The, the seals affect one-fourth of the earth. The trumpets affect one-third of the earth. One-fourth, one-third. What's happening? Intensification. The battle is getting bigger and bigger. Now go to the bowls, the last storyline. Let me read one of those. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living th thing in the sea died. Watch one-fourth, one-third, all of it, 25%, 33%, 100%. What's happening with this? What does all this mean? John is writing with brilliancy. It is a masterpiece of uh, penmanship, what he's writing here, and he is suggesting that the battle of good and evil will intensify throughout the ages, that that battle of good and evil will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and evil will become stronger and stronger and stronger. I heard today a news report where they were talking about some examples of evil in the world right now that just seem mind-boggling and the reporter made a statement something like I, I can't believe it's gotten this bad w what do you mean you can't believe that 
What do you mean you can't believe that evil gets more and more powerful through the year? What, what do you mean by that? And that's what John tells us with these storylines. One-fourth, one-third, 100%. Have, have you ever thought to yourself, well, it can't get any worse than this? Yes, it can. And yes, it will. See, that's why one of the strongest challenges in the book of Revelation is perseverance. The perseverance of the saints. That when evil has its day, when, when Satan beats you up a little bit, when he is messing with you and the struggle gets real. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about because the struggle is real for you. With this many people tuning in to this study, there's a lot of people out there that you are in the thick of the battle of good and evil, and evil is whooping like it's never whooped before. And the message of the book of Revelation is, now you got to stay connected to Jesus. you got to stay engaged in his word. you got to stay committed to his family, the church. you got to persevere even though evil gets worse and worse and worse and worse worse. Powerful concept that we learn about the seals and the scroll. Here's another detail that I think is really important. We'll talk about this a number of times in the remainder of the book, and that is the grouping of the seals. Now, now, now pay very careful attention to this. There are seven seals, and I'm going to teach you a formula about that that goes like this. Four, two, interlude, one. Four, two, interlude, one. Now, what are you talking about, Hastings? Watch this. The first four seals go together in make one, and they make one vision. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Then... When we look at the next lesson, when we come back, we're going to find that the fifth and the sixth seal go together. So you got four, two, and the fifth and sixth seal create one vision. And then after the sixth seal, there is a pause. There's an interlude, and John throws in some other information about some stuff, and then he comes back to the last Seventh seal, four, two, interlude, one, four, two, interlude, one. Now, just as a side note here, when we are done with this study, I want you to put that on your social media page. I want you to take a minute, and I'm asking everybody to share this study. But here's what I want you to just, I want you to put this on your page, four, Two interlude one four two interlude one, and that's going to tell all of us that watch this. Ah, they watch the study. I know what they're talking about. People that don't know it, they're going to be asking you, "What are you even talking about?" And you can point them to this. So just kind of a funny thing. Four two interlude one. Now watch this because this will blow your mind. It may not blow your mind, but it'll raise your eyebrows at least. Remember, we go seals, and then the next time we're going to talk about seven trumpets. Watch. The trumpets have the same formula. First four trumpets go together. Next two trumpets, numbers five and six, they go together. And then there's a pause. There's an interlude. And then the last trumpet comes along. See, four, two, interlude one with the seals. Four, two, interlude one with the bowls. There is no way that's accidental. The book of Revelation is this carefully designed, structured novel, this absolute masterpiece. And if you learn to train yourself to see it in things like these seven sections and then see the intensification of the story every time it's told, understand key symbolism like the number seven and paying attention, are we in heaven or are we on earth? Those all help you to see this well thought out design of the book and it helps you to correctly interpret it. That's why it is so important to go through a study like this because you would never in a million years see that without somebody unfolding that for us.
Now, here's another detail of the seals I want you to kind of wrap your, your mind around. I want us to play with this a little bit. I call it the timing of the seals. And so we're going to open up the first four here in this study. And so when we do that and we look at seals five and six and those kinds of things, you ask yourself, when does this happen? When are these seals open? And that's a great question. And as you would probably guess, there is not a consensus on that answer among scholars throughout history. There are intelligent, godly people who answer that question differently. There's every conceivable answer you could think of as far as the timing of these seals. When did they open? You can you can read people who say they've already all been opened. There are others who say none of them have been opened yet. Some scholars believe that they have been opened and they tell you dates in which they were opened. And others say they've not been opened and here's the dates they're going to be opened. I mean, it's just across the board. My understanding of the timing, um, and the reason we're going to talk about my understanding is because I'm teaching the course. So um, I, I, here, here's where I'm at. But understand, not everybody's where I'm at. I'm not where everybody else is at. But, but here's how I see it. I see three things about the timing. Number one is I see them happening after the resurrection of Jesus. And why is that? Because in this section, uh, section four, five, six, seven, Jesus is resurrected in heaven. So I see all these seals starting to be opened up after the resurrection of Jesus. The second thing I see them ha happening is I see them happening while the church is still on the earth, which means before the second coming of Jesus. In other words, Jesus is still in heaven. He's not returned yet. And so if you put those two things together, okay, after the resurrection and before his second coming, do you know when that is? Now. Now. I see the opening of these seals happening right now. And then this is the last thing I have to say about the timing from my perspective is I think they are timeless. And what I mean by that is they happen after the resurrection, they happen before the second coming of Jesus, but they are always happening. You can't really pinpoint them down to a particular age or a particular date. As we go through them, you will find out that they have always been happening and they will always happen up until the second coming of Christ. Now, the last important thing I'll say about the seals, and we're gonna start opening them up, and that is what I call the catalyst. The catalyst is, is the initiator, the one who, who makes things happen. And here's what is, is, I know I say they're all important, okay? But this is really important. The catalyst of the seals is really simple. Satan is the catalyst of the first four. First four seals belong to the enemy. They belong to evil. The last three seals belong to God. They're the force of good. Four belong to evil. The last three belong to God. I've used this analogy before um, in some sermons that I've done here at Eastside, but, but I think it's a good way to think about this. Um, think of LeBron James taking me on uh, in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball, LeBron versus me. Or you can put yourself in the story too, doesn't matter, it ends up with the same uh, same ending, we both are going to get spanked, okay? Me and LeBron, and we're going to play a game, first person score 20 baskets, they win. So I get the ball, and LeBron goes and sits over on the bench, and I just start I just start dribbling up and making layups, and I'm I'm making them right and left, and he's over there drinking a coke and eating some nachos and listening to radio, and and I mean he's he's just he's not even there, and I'm just I'm just I'm just stealing the game. And finally, I look at him and said, "Hey, dude, I'm winning 19 to nothing. I'm spanking you." And he says, "Okay," and he puts his stuff down. He comes out and grabs the ball, and guess what? In about two minutes, he wins 20 to 19. Okay, that's what happens with the seals. First four seals come out. The catalyst is Satan. He does his business, 
it looks like he's going to win the game. And a lot of us, you know, we, we're kind of right there and we're thinking, man, we're, we're getting beat. Evil is having its day. It's tearing us up. And then the last three, God gets off the bleachers and comes into the game and game over. Good defeats evil. So all of those little details about the seals are really, really important. They're very, very important. And so with those, those uh, detailed bits of information, we now start to break open the seals and let's identify them. And, and remember, these are the work of the enemy, the first four. First seal. Verses 1 through 2 gives way to a rider on a white horse. So the first seal's opened up, going to reveal to us what God is going to do in the control room of heaven in the battle of good and evil. We open up the first seal, we peek into the scroll, and John says, there's a white horse. A white horse shows up on the scene. And some schools of thought immediately think that this must refer to Jesus. It must refer to Christ for, for a couple reasons. The color white symbolizes purity. And so obviously that's a character trait of Christ. And secondly, we know from the end of the book in Revelation chapter 19, when the end of all time is coming uh, into view of John, he's describing what it's like at the end of the story, we find at that point that Christ shows up on a white horse. Let, let me read this for you. You can write it down and look at it later. Revelation 19, chapter 19, toward the end of the book, verse 11, he says this, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true. And so we know that white means, white means purity Jesus is pure. We know at the end of the world, uh, we, we see him on a white horse. And so we open up this first seal. We see a, a, a white, we say, that's Jesus right there. And the primary difficulty with that interpretation is it doesn't fit the context. Remember that the first four seals go together and you will see with obvious clarity that seals two, three, and four are all evil. And so it just doesn't make sense that you would group Jesus into that. So if the white horse and the rider on it is not Jesus, who is it? What is it? I want to suggest that one of the most pronounced tactics of Satan is deception. That Satan has the ability to deceive. To get you to think something is right when it's not right at all. In fact, we're told at another place in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, the Apostle Paul said, For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. The more that Satan can convince us that, the more we end up in a world where we are being deceived. And I would propose to you at a greater level than has ever been noticed in the history of modern man that we are being deceived by the enemy. He convinces us that which is right is really wrong and that which is wrong is really right. And we are a culture who've been caught up in deception. 650 years before Jesus ever walked the earth, the prophet Isaiah said this, woe to those. In other words, bad stuff, bad stuff to those who call evil good and who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah said almost 3,000 years ago that there's going to come a time in which people take things that have always been right 
and now say those things are wrong. Things that have always been wrong, and now those things are right. And I want to propose that what we're seeing right now in the white horse is that the tactic of the enemy, the move of Satan in the battle of good and evil, is to deceive you about truth. And you just think about that a little bit. And you think about all the temptations and things that Satan throws at people and what he wants us to do in the midst of temptation. He wants us to see what he proposes as good. He doesn't even show us the evil part of it. I, I wrote a few damn, when an alcoholic takes his first drink, there's nothing mentioned by Satan at that moment about liver disease and loss of job and potential divorces. He, he, didn't, he didn't say any of those things. He just talks about the fact that the drink tastes good. It makes you feel relaxed. He deceives you. Someone gets caught up in the trap of uncontrolled materialism. Satan isn't going to mention anything about bankruptcy or shame or poverty. No, he just wants to get caught up in what it feels temporarily good when you're keeping up with the Joneses or you're driving a new car or living in a nice house that you can't afford. He didn't tell you the bad stuff because he wants to deceive. We had a dollar every time somebody told me, Pastor, in the midst of this affair that I'm having, I really believe God brought us together. Do you, do you think God would bring anybody together if that meant the separation of a marriage and the broken heart of kids? Satan doesn't do any of that as far as telling the truth. He never does that. He deceives and so my interpretation of the first seal, the white rider of the horse, the hoarder, the rider on the white horse, is that we are seeing the deceptive onslaught of evil in order to wreak havoc in our life. And you read through it, and it makes sense. The rider ho holds a bow. He's not interested in a peace gathering here. His intent is to hurt. He's given a crown. That is disheartening what we see. It's saying that he will victoriously deceive people. He will win these battles. I, th I think about in my own life the times he deceived me and he won. He will ride out as a conqueror. He is looking for a fight. He wants to win the battle. That's the first seal. Now, the second seal gives way to a rider on a red horse. And if you start reading in verse 3, you find out this red horse opens. So we open the first seal. We see the effect of Satan. I'm going to deceive people. He opens the second horse, uh, the second seal. And now this red horse comes up. And most commentators believe that is a reference to military conflict, to war. The color red is typical of blood that's shed in military battles. And you read about this imagery here and, and you find this description. He takes peace away from the earth. He causes men to slay each other. His primary tool is a, a large sword. And so there are some people who look at the second seal and say that is a reference to one of the things that Satan will do in this battle of good and evil. He will just cause nations to be at war with each other over, 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 and over. And you think about it and you say, man, that's true. Historically, we have been in conflict with other nations. All nations have been. Now, I, I want to give full disclosure on this because I don't read a lot of commentators who kind of take my view on this. So I, I know I'm in the minority here, and that makes me wonder if I'm wrong about it. Okay, maybe it is about war. I think the rider on the red horse is, is more broad than war. I think what we're seeing here is that the tactic of the enemy is to divide us, division among human beings. See, first seal is to deceive us. The next one is to divide us. 
And yeah, military conflict is an example of that. That's a part of that strategy. But it, it's not just happening on a military zone. It can happen in a marriage. It can happen where you work. It can happen at the Little League Baseball Diamond. It can happen in churches. Whenever human beings are at odds with each other, it fits into the game plan of Satan for us to destroy each other. Now, this makes me pause here for a second um, because I, 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 I again want the knowledge in the head to move south to the heart. That's when it makes life change, okay? And so in our head at this point, we're, we're starting to see the battle of good and evil, and here's Satan's tactics, okay? Deception, and he will destroy some people with that. And then division. It, it just gets us divided among each other. I believe one of the most devastating effects of COVID-19 is how it has divided the human race. And yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I fully get it. A lot of people have gotten sick and a lot of people have died. Horrible, horrible effects of this ungodly disease that has infiltrated this earth. Horrible. But the worst effect of all is that we have been so mean to each other. I've read and heard some of the worst things that people say to each other, all in the name of a virus that none of them fully know about. And we're being attacked on a daily basis by the rider of the red horse. That's his strategy. You know, when you, when you think about that, and you, you spend a time and, and really mull over that. And I'd, I'd challenge you in the midst of where we're at in this study right now, in, in a day of, of COVID-19, I, I would challenge you to spend time and, and, and not contemplate things like vaccines and masks and mandate all, all that's important but but can you get your head out of that for a second and, and just think in terms of why division is so anti-god did you ever pay attention to the prayer of jesus the night before he died john chapter 17 you can read it and it's this intense prayer before he knows an arrest is happening momentarily that will lead to his execution. It's his last time really to pray. And, and one of the things he prays about is his church of the future. And, he, and he's, he's praying about me and you. He's praying about the believers, those who are going to believe in his name in history. He's praying about us. It's the last time he's ever going to pray about us. And you think of all the things that he would ask God, would you do this for him? Would you do this for him? Would you do? He only asked for one thing. You know what it was? Unity. May they be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you've sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Did you catch that? The last prayer of Jesus is that you and I would get along because he knew the red horse is coming. He knew it. And he prayed. He knew that there would be people who would be deceived by the enemy and attacked by the red horse, and we would be divided against each other. The third, the third seal gives way to a rider on a black horse. 
So starting in the fifth verse, we start to see this seal opened up. And if you read various scholars on this, you'll see that the general interpretation that we're talking about seems to be famine here. And so if you read through the imagery that John writes, there is this idea of tremendous shortage uh, going on. We have to weigh things out on scales like we're rationing. We don't have enough of those things. And, and, and prices of common household goods are extremely high. And so I played with those a little bit and said, if, if, we, if we looked at the prices listed here for elements common in that day and related it to our day, it, it looks like things were about 10 times higher than they should be. And so you, you go buy a loaf of bread for $10, or you get a gallon of milk for $25, or you buy a pair of tennis shoes for $1,500. Nothing can be wasted at all. So you you protect the things of special care. And, and so all that imagery kind of presents this idea that we're talking about famine. And so so another tactic of Satan in the battle of good and evil will be these periods of famine. Now, now you and I can hear that, and and to be honest, that's kind of foreign to us. Okay, we we know what for what what famine is. We've we've read about it. We know there's places on the earth that that deal with that, but we we've not had anything close to that in our, our lifetime. And so I've often wondered if the real meaning of the black horse is a little bit more than just famine. I, I wonder about that. I wonder if famine is an expression, one expression of Satan's desire to bring disaster into our lives. A famine would be an example, of, uh, but so is flood and fire and earthquake and tornado and, and hurricane. In, in other words, Satan will use moments, seasons, chapters of disaster to wreak havoc into our life. So, so we've got, we have deception and we have division and we have disaster. And, and if you think about that, I, I was concerning myself about how that plays into the teachings of Jesus and back before Jesus was arrested and taken away to be executed, he did a lot of last minute teaching. And one of his teachings was about, this is what it's going to be like at the end of time. And so you can read that in Matthew chapter 24. Let, let me read uh, what, what he said, just a portion of it, and, and pay attention to the first, second, and third seals, okay? Pay attention to deception, division, disaster. He said this. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I'm the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all of these are the beginning of the birth pains. He, he's, he's talking about first seal, second seal, third seal. Now, if you're starting to go, this is not a feel-good lesson you're right, and it's going to get worse in a minute here. Watch. Uh, first seal, what is it? Deception. Second seal, what is it? Division. Third seal, what is it? Disaster. Let's look at the fourth seal. The fourth seal gives way to a rider on a pale horse, and John actually interprets that one for us. We don't have to interpret it. He interprets it as death. This is the ultimate goal of of the enemy. The number one thing that Satan wants to do in our life. You ever wonder what Satan wanted what Satan wanted to do to yes, he wants to deceive us. Yes, he wants to divide us. Yes, he wants to bring disaster in our life. But if you want to know number one thing in his mind, he wants us dead. 
And the seal tells us that he will use whatever he has to do to bring that about. Sword, famine, wild beast. What's that mean, wild beast? It means whatever it takes. That's his goal, that you and I die. But, but, but you're missing it if you stop there because you will notice that it has this phrase, and Hades is following close behind. What does that mean? Hades generally thought of as a place where people went after they died. And so Hades in the Bible was this idea of the abode, the living place of the dead. And it generally became a synonym for hell. So so Satan wants us to die, and then he wants us to be sent to hell. And so the pale horse is actually Satan's attempt to cause our physical death and our spiritual death. And gang, that's that's why the resurrection of Jesus has such enormous power for the Christian. Be honest about it. Have you ever wondered, really, come on, really, why all the fluff at Easter Really? Why? Why? I know he rose. I get all that. Why? Why? Because we all die physically as humans. All of us. It's a result of sin in this world. It's because of what Adam and Eve did, and it carried on. And the Bible says it is appointed once for everybody to die. Everybody's going to physically die. But the resurrection of Jesus, which passed to those who follow him so that it's the resurrection of Jesus and now it's my resurrection and your resurrection if you've embraced Jesus. Watch this. That means that the number one thing that Satan can do to us to send us into hell has been taken away from him. He cannot do that. It was as if Christ said to Satan, give me your best shot you got. And so Satan kills him physically and Jesus rises from the dead. Is that all you got? Is that all you got? That is the point of Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. Another trivia thing for you. What's the resurrection chapter in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, and it ends when Paul says, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? You might physically kill us. You'll never spiritually kill us. Where, O oh pale horse, is your victory? Where, O oh pale horse, is your sting? Now, let's just stop here for a minute and see where we've been tonight. First four seals are Satan's battle plan in the global war of good and evil. He will use deception, division, disaster, and death. And, and, and watch this. Me and you, we've experienced every one of them. Every one of them. If you start training your mind to watch for that, you will see that every single day. Every day. And the only logical response to that, the only logical response is, God, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? And God answers that question with the remaining seals. Remember, the last three are his. First four belong to Satan. The last three belong to Jesus. And somebody stronger than LeBron is about to enter the game. And he does it in the fifth seal. But that's next week. And so come back next week to see how God will respond to this. Don't forget, share this. It has effect 
in getting other people to hear the word of God. And just put on your share, put on your post, four, two, interlude, one. And your friends will say, what? And you'll say, I know exactly what that means. See you next week. Seal number five. Have a great week.